Good morning. Good morning. Our uh, scripture reading today is from Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 14, uh, the ESV version. Hear the word of the Lord. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For we have been united with him in death like this. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we could no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin. Once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So if I can recap uh, the book of Romans so far. Chapter 1, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their unrighteousness. Chapter 3, 4, none is righteous. No, not one. No one seeks God. No one does good. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The doctrine of the wrath of God being revealed from heaven. The doctrine of the flesh of man, that there is no one righteous, not even one. Setting up the doctrine of justification, that we are justified before God by faith alone, not by works of the law. Chapter 3, but now the righteousness of God has been revealed, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ, to be justified by faith alone. The picture for me is, is like you were swimming in the ocean, drowning, about to go under, when the Coast Guard named Jesus, right, came along to rescue you. And your exercise of faith was like, like waving your arm. And if that was your rescue, can you imagine telling the story later? And saying, yeah, I was in trouble, I was out there, but you should have seen how I waved my arm. It was a super impressive act of waving, right? I mean, if you told the story, wouldn't all of the emphasis be on the Coast Guard for finding you in the middle of the ocean, for coming to rescue you? So we are saved by faith alone, but even our faith, that's all it is. It is a, it is a wave of help. A cry for help that there is no credit in it. All the credit goes to the one who came to save us and who gave his life, entering really the chaos and judgment of the sea in order to deliver us. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He has brought us into himself where there is peace and rest with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That now brings us to chapter 6. We've been going over this verse 
so that we could let this truth really sink into our hearts and minds. If we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. What a, what a beautiful theological truth. The believer in Jesus has been united with Jesus. How can we be justified? How can we have peace with God? How can we be forgiven and free and filled with the Spirit? All of those things are because of our union with Jesus. Every spiritual blessing in Christ comes to you if you've been united with Jesus. Notice there's two unions here. First, in the past, being united with his death. Then in the future, being united with him in his resurrection. The future resurrection depends entirely on the past union with his death. So hear this, and don't miss in, in verse 5 there, the big if. If we have been united with him in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. Do not presume that you will be united with him in his eternal resurrection and life forever if you have not been united with him already in his death. Remember what Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after me. To commit to Jesus is to pick up a cross, which was an instrument of execution. You cannot come to Jesus in faith without dying to yourself. The only way to be united with Jesus in his life is first to be united in his death. The old you must die. But if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. The, the analogy here is very much based on a marriage relationship. How a husband and wife are united in everything that they brought to, comes together in that union. So let's envision a fictitious couple we'll call Susan and John. Now, Susan came from a, I don't, I don't think we have a Susan and John here, do we? Uh, if we did, it's all purely coincidental. Okay. Let's imagine Susan comes from a very poor situation. She comes from a broken family. She brings that, that Susan and John, they, they met in college, and Susan graduates with $100,000 in debt. Kids don't do that, don't graduate, but that's what she did. So she was from a poor family. She comes out with all this debt. Now, John comes from a wealthy family. He has a million dollars in a trust fund, and he's from a, a healthy, loving home. And so here's the, the, the two meet. Susan bringing her debt and dysfunctional family background. John bringing his wealth and bringing also a loving, positive family. Think about what happened to Susan on the day they got married. Everything they had separately was now brought together. And John, being a sensible money manager, immediately zeroed out her debt. Now, of course, you see that cost him something to pay off her debt. But in that union, all of her debts became his, and all of his assets became Hers. So think about what that must have felt like to have all of that debt she was carrying in an instant paid off. But that wasn't the end of it, right? Because she was united with John, she was united with his whole family. His parents insisted that she call them mom and dad. She was invited to all their reunions and gatherings. She was in on the Instagram community, right? And just since, since this is a purely fictitious couple, let's say that John's family owns the Disney Polynesian Resort, and they can always go whenever they want to any Disney, <laughs> Disney park, right? So you see how because she's united with him, she not only gets his money, right? She gets everything that was his. She now has access to the Disney Polynesian, and they can go wherever they want. I'm sorry to bring my materialism into it. <laughs> Do you see how, how this is so true and so beautifully true? Her broken family now assumed into his healthy family. You see how beautifully true this is of Jesus. On the day that you committed your life to him in faith, you waved your hand. Lord Jesus, save me. And he drew you into his lifeboat of salvation. You were united with him. In that moment of your saving faith, all of your debt was transferred to him. All of his wealth was transferred to you. The Bible word is justification, 
Righteousification, all of Jesus' righteousness credited to you. All of his perfection, all of his glory, even his own Holy Spirit. Where Susan, before marrying John, was bound in her debt, fearful of the future, <laughs> vulnerable in her relationships. Now married to John, she is safe in his love. She's secure in his finances. She's loved and accepted and valued in his family. Everything about her life is totally different. And it's even more true of the follower of Jesus. All of your debt forever paid. All of his righteousness credited to you. If, if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Don't rush past that if. When, when I do premarital counseling, one of the first things I tell a young couple is this very profound statement. You're not married until you're married. And those of you who are married understand the significance of that. You are not married until you're married. Now, at what point are you married? It's not engagement. Getting the ring and putting a ring on it, that does not make you married. At what point are you married? At the moment that you say your vows. I always tell couples that. Don't stress about all the details, the flowers and the, all this, and, the, and the food. Don't stress about that. All that matters in the wedding ceremony is that you stand before God and some witnesses and say vows. It's those vows to love and to cherish, to honor and to serve as, as long as we both shall live. It's those vows by which God unites two into one. You say your vows, you're married. Princess Bride reminds us, you didn't say it, you didn't do it. Not married. You're not married until you're married. So the relevance for young couples, right? Don't act like, I'll look at this side of the room, right? Don't act like you're married until you're actually married. That's so important. Lots of reasons that's important. Don't, the relevance for us right now, to, to feel that if from Romans 6, don't assume that you're married to Jesus. Don't assume that this applies to you if you have never made your vows. If you can't think of a time when you knelt before Jesus and pledged your life and your soul and your heart to him. If you can't think of a time when you denied yourself, you took up your cross, and you committed to follow after him. Now, the beauty of the gospel is that Jesus reaches out his hand and extends his grace and forgiveness to anyone. He's offered, he's, he's proposed marriage to everyone on this planet. But it does not happen automatically. That marriage union takes place when you commit yourself to him in faith. And the symbol of that, the ring, if you will, is baptism. It's not the ring that makes you married. It's the vows that make you married. You can say vows without having rings. It doesn't have to be a gold ring. It can be a plaid. It doesn't matter. That's a symbol. The ring doesn't make you married. The vows do. Similarly, baptism doesn't get you saved, but it represents that salvation. What saves you is the vow. Do you feel that? We are justified by faith alone. There's no credit in that. It's a wave of the hand. It's a yes to the Lord. But if you have not knelt before Jesus and called upon him to save you in faith, if you have not pledged your life to him, then don't assume this applies to you. Because all of this depends on that if. If we've been united with him in his death, we will certainly be united with him in his resurrection. What we'll see in this passage are six wedding gifts that Jesus gives in the moment that you are one with him. He brings these wedding gifts to you. But he does not, he cannot give them out to just everyone. Jesus is, it's an all or nothing package. And if you belong to Jesus, then all that is his becomes yours. We'll see that there's two categories. First, we're united with him in his life. And we're united with him in his love. And we'll see the six gifts fit into those two categories. So I want you to, I want you to write this from your own perspective. If I am united with Christ, I have his life. If I'm united with Christ, I have his love with the six gifts that come with that. Now, Romans 6 is answering a question. Shall we 
Go on sinning so that grace may increase. If you start to if you start to process the doctrine of justification by faith alone, this question will come up. If I'm saved for free, based entirely on the work of Jesus, not by anything that I do, it's not about my works, does that mean that the Christian life is a free-for-all? I can do whatever I want. I can sin as much as I want. In fact, the more that I sin, the more Jesus forgives, and the more glorious he is for all that grace. There's a logic to that thinking, and Paul addresses it directly. So, the more we sin, the more he's glorified. Let's sin more, so the grace may abound. Absolutely not. The by no means there is the strongest Greek form of negation. If he had emojis, he would put a bunch in there, distressed faces or something. Here's how we'll do it. It's an absolutely not. There's stronger ways I could have said it in English, but I chose, okay. We are those who have died to sin how can we live in it any longer? This is the question. What is the Christian's relationship to sin? Is it just okay to go on sinning? His answer appeals to our identity and our union with Jesus. We are those who have died to sin. Remember, before you committed your life to Jesus, you were dead in sin. That was your condition. Dead in your sin. Once you committed to Jesus in faith, you were dead to sin. Believers, we are not in our sin anymore. We are dead to that sin. We died to sin. How can we continue to live in it? Or don't you know what baptism is about? To be baptized into Jesus. We, we, we use the phrase in English, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. The Greek word is actually into, it's the preposition into, which conveys the same thing it does in English. You are baptized into the life of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When you were baptized into Christ, you were baptized into his death. This is what baptism represents. You go underwater as a symbol of death and burial. Your old self, your fleshly, selfish, proud, stubborn, self-reliant self, that old self was buried with Jesus. I'll ask kids, this is why you don't want to bring your kids until they're 10 or you know, 12 or 14 years old, because if I meet with them about baptism, I say, what is it about? What happens to you if you go underwater? If I put you underwater and I don't bring you up, what happens? You die, right? That's what happens. That's why it's not a long period of time that you're underwater, right? But that's what it represents. It represents that something did die. Thankfully, baptism services are not grim ordeals. You know, like, it's quick, right? But that's what it represents, is that your old self was buried with Jesus. That we were buried with him through baptism into death. Again, it's not the baptism that accomplishes it, but it symbolizes it in a beautiful way. United with him in his death, buried with him, in order to be raised with him, that we too may, may live a new life. The old self crucified with him, dying with him, that we might rise with him. You see the symbol? Going underwater, your old self died. It's coming up from the water, a new creation, reborn, a new person with a new life, a new heart, a new identity, all because of your union with Jesus. At the moment that you cry out in faith to Jesus to save you, you're transported through time. Think about what happens. That old sinful self that is defined by sin, controlled by sin, is transported through time and is nailed to the cross. Our old self was crucified with him. Buried with him. And when Jesus walked out of the tomb in a resurrected, glorified body, there was no sin on him anymore. He left it behind in the tomb. I love to ask kids that. Where is your sin now? Where is it? Jesus took it on the cross and it was buried with him. He walked out of the tomb and it wasn't on him anymore. Where is it? If it's anywhere, it's in the tomb, right? It's gone, it's separated from you as far as the east is from the west. 
Jesus dealt with it on the cross, sealed it away in the tomb where it was vaporized through his perfect redemption. Your sin is gone. It's not waiting in a vault somewhere to be brought out and held against you. It's gone. It's been transported through time, nailed to the cross, so you bear it no more. It's the wonder and beauty of the gospel to be united with Christ. Here's the first of the six gifts. What he gives you initially is his perfection. We saw this last week. This is what justification is about. In Christ, we can not only see the perfection of God because now the righteousness of God has been manifested in the person of Jesus. We can not only see that righteousness in Jesus, we can receive it from him through his act of redemption, his death and resurrection. Verse 14, sin shall no longer be your master since you are no longer under law, but you are under grace. Come back next week. Jason's going to preach on Romans chapter 8, how the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death outside of Christ. People are under sin. Sin is their master. They belong to it. They're controlled by it. They're defined by it. Sin confuses. It corrupts. It controls. And it consumes. Sin is like a fire that is burning inside a non-believer, controlling them and gradually taking over every part of their life. They're under Sin. Sin is their master. It's the controlling presence of their lives. But for the believer, sin is no longer the controlling presence of your life. That power is broken. You're no longer under sin. Now you are under grace. Chapter 3, the righteousness of God received through faith in Jesus Christ and given to all who believe and are justified, declared righteous by his grace as a gift. Again, back to John and Susan. All of Susan's debt, the moment she married John, all of that debt became his. And thankfully, he had the resources to deal with it. On the day you committed your life to Jesus, all of your debt became his. He took it from you. That's the doctrine of forgiveness. Jesus paid it all. All of your sins, past, present, and future, all of them transported to the cross, nailed to the cross, buried and sealed away with him. He took all of your debt and he gave you all of his righteousness, all of his perfection. The judicial verdict declared in advance. This is why there's no fear of condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We have the verdict already. Jesus has already given us his perfection be like Susan a week after she's married to John, suddenly disappearing, and they go look for her, and they can't find her, and they eventually find her down in, in the city begging for food or worse. And John picks her up and says, what are you doing? Why are you out here on the street? That's, that's not who you are anymore. You're, you're part of our family. We have resources. We have ways of making money. You don't have to be out on the street begging for scraps. Why, brothers and sisters, do we go back to our old ways of sin? It's because we haven't fully realized who we are in Christ and all that we have in him. That we're tempted to go back like beggars on the streets looking for scraps in this world when we've been seated at the banqueting table with the Lord of the universe. We have the perfection of Jesus. Along with that comes his power. These are all interconnected. And so Paul says, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And don't let sin reign anymore. He says, sin doesn't reign in your life anymore. You've died. How can it reign over you anymore? But don't let it reign because it'll try. It will continually try. Sin is not just bad choices we make. It is a growing power that had total dominion over you before you knew Jesus. But it is a power that remains, even though it no longer reigns, sin remains in the life of the Christian. And we must continually put to death those deeds of the old 
flesh. But now we have a new master. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us. We have the armor of God. We'll see in a couple of weeks. Sin is no longer your master, but it is still your enemy. You've been equipped for the battle. You have the power of the Holy Spirit. You have the sword of the Spirit. You have the shield of faith. The power of Jesus lives within us. So don't let sin reign. Should we go on sinning? Absolutely not. Here's how Paul prays for the church in Ephesus. That, that you may know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believes, the power that is like when he worked in Christ, when he raised him from the dead. What kind of power is available for the believer in Jesus? The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. What greater power could there be than power to raise the dead? Remember when, when Jesus stood at the tomb of Lazarus, who'd been dead four days, and he's talking to Martha about how he's going to raise the dead, and she says, I know you will at the last day, and he says, no. I am the resurrection and the life. And he ordered that the stone be rolled away. And with a word of command, all he said was, Lazarus, come out. Who has the power to speak to the dead and have them obey? This is the power that lives in the heart of believers. This is why Paul prays that we would know this power, that we would experience the truth, that we would realize the power that does actually live inside of us. Not our power, but of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. This is why Jesus said to his disciples, it's better for you that I go so I can send you my Holy Spirit, and then you'll do even greater things than I do. We have Jesus' perfection. Because we're united with him, he's given us his righteousness. We have his power because we're united with him, and we have his very spirit living inside of us to guide us and empower us. We also have his purpose. That's why Paul says, don't continue in sin. That's not who you are anymore. You have a whole new mission, a whole new identity. Don't offer yourselves to sin, but offer yourselves to God and every part of yourself. Offer it to him as a living sacrifice devoted to his purposes and his plans. Being united with Jesus means you have a whole new life, a whole new identity, a whole new family, a whole new mission. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. That was his mission, was to serve. So our mission is to serve. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. So our mission is to seek and save the lost. Jesus came to call out a community and he commanded his disciples to love one another. This is our mission, to love one another, to serve one another, to build up the church for whom Jesus died. He came and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor. So our mission is to preach good news to the poor. He came to seek and save the lost. That is who he's sent us to. And this is why Paul says to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain because his whole identity was wrapped up in the person of Jesus. Can you say that for yourself? Has the mission of Jesus become your mission because his life is yours? You say, for me, to live is Christ and to die would be gain because it would just bring me home to my Lord and Savior. Now, the day that uh, Kristen and I got married is a story of riches to rags. Uh, or, or, or not, not because her family was super wealthy, but the boyfriend she was dating before was wealthy, like, like owned his own plane, not his parents' plane, but his own plane, kind of wealthy, th that kind of thing. And I was driving a hand-me-down Dodge Colt. So <laughs> she married me, and, and, and when we got married, everything came together. You know, it was, it was all, we shared everything in common, and, and believe me, I did not bring perfection to that equation. I did not bring power to that equation, at least not financially, on my youth ministry internship salary. Um, and, but I did bring purpose. She married a youth pastor. She married me knowing I was called to ministry, and my mission was to serve and mobilize the church. And so that purpose became her purpose, became her mission. And, and those of you who've gotten to know Kristen know what a tremendous blessing that she is and how, what, a, what a partner God gave me in her. And, and the ways that she, sir, did I get an amen there? Yeah. yeah. 
the ways that she serves, and they're mostly ways you don't see. Sometimes she sings, but she serves. The, the executive pastor we served for four years in, uh, in Charlotte, and the executive pastor, when we were leaving, said, Darren, we're going to miss you, but we are really going to miss your wife. Because <laughs> he knew, he understood how much she did and the role that she played and the love that she brought. Because we were married, my purpose in life became hers, and her purpose became mine. We were united in that sense. The same thing is true with Jesus. Don't deceive yourself into thinking that you're united with Jesus if all you want is for your purpose to be his. If all you ever pray is, Lord, bless me and fulfill my plans. To be united with Jesus is to embrace his mission, his purpose, his plan. To say with Paul, to live as Christ and to die is gain. We move on. The first part. If I am united with Christ, I have his love. I have his life, and now we see we have his love. We know, verse 6, that our old self was crucified with him, that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Jesus provides the, the fullness of love. And all true love both protects and provides. Jesus protects us from the greatest danger to all of humanity, which is sin and the judgment that sin deserves. And so he dealt with that body that was ruled by sin, the body of death he, he dealt with, removed it from us through his death and resurrection, which is why Romans 8.1 is true, that there is now no condemnation for us because instead of condemning us for our sin, God condemned our sin in his son. Jesus endured the condemnation that we deserve in order to protect us from it. He is the only shelter from the coming wrath of God. He is the only protection through his body on the cross. But this is what he gives to those who are united with him, is the protection of his love, of his grace, of his blood, of his sacrifice. In Christ, if I'm united with him, I have his love, I have his protection. Along with that clearly comes his provision, primarily of that eternal inheritance. If we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Now, at the moment of saving faith, the new creation takes place. You're reborn at that moment. You receive the life of Jesus right then. His spirit comes to fill you and, and live inside of you. But this is a future promise of a future resurrection. This is the eternal provision, the eternal inheritance that we have with Jesus. To be glorified in a moment, First Corinthians says, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, which means when Jesus comes back, the dead will be raised imperishable. We will be raised with him in a resurrection like his. In that last day, when the last trumpet sounds, that's when the dead will rise. Some to eternal judgment and condemnation. Others to eternal life and joy in the Lord. The dead will be raised and the mortal will be clothed with immortality. That is our upgrade, believer. That is our humanity 2.0, really our humanity infinity .0. Pick the best time of your life. Are you 20, 25, 30? Pick your, you will have that body forever. No more arthritis, no more aches and pains, no more illness or sadness or death. Forever glorified, forever free from all sin. Forever seeing Jesus fully and completely as he is. If we have been united with him in a death like his. We will certainly also share in that eternal inheritance. We will be raised up to a glorified state. The mortal will be clothed with immortality. That is our future inheritance. But Jesus not only provides a glorious future, he provides a grace-filled present. We have been blessed in Christ Jesus with every spiritual blessing. At the moment you're united with Jesus in faith, everything that is his becomes yours. Every spiritual blessing. We've been talking about forgiveness and justification, the power of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, the love, joy, peace, patience, the character of Jesus that he infuses in us, the new heart that he gives us with new desires. 
to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Everything that belongs to Jesus becomes yours at the moment you're united with him. The final gift we'll talk about today, and there are a thousand more we can talk about from Scripture, but what we see here is that we will also be united with his whole family. We saw this happen with the married couple. John and Susan, now they're one. Their family is a shared experience. All of John's family becomes hers. This is true of us as believers. Every believer on this planet is a brother or sister in Christ. To be united with Jesus is to be united with his Father. This is why we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. To be one with Jesus is to have his Holy Spirit living inside of us, guiding us into all truth, empowering us for works of ministry. We are one body, one family in the household of God. You are no longer strangers and outcasts, outsiders to the blessing of God. But now, you're fellow citizens and members of the household of God. If, if I'm united with Christ, I have his life and his love. Have you made your vows to Jesus? He's extended his hand to everyone. He came as his proposal to the world to demonstrate the love of God and the righteousness of God. To say forgiveness is available. He came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Forgiveness is available. Freedom, new life, new purpose, new power is available for all who will call on him in faith. If we've been united with him, in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. If you can't think of a time when you hit your knees to call on Jesus in faith, to say, take my old self, all of my sin, all of my selfishness, nail it to the cross, take it from me. Give me your life and freedom and forgiveness. If you can't think of that time, then please meet with someone today. Contact me, contact your small group leader, one of our elders, contact Jason. We'd love to meet with you. If you've never been baptized by immersion, what this passage represents, please contact me or Jason or one of the elders and let's talk about that. How that might be so encouraging. It won't save you, it won't change your eternal destiny, but it would be an encouragement to you and to everyone here in the church family to hear you share your story of how that is true of you. Your old self was crucified and, and buried. That's not who you are anymore. You're not defined or controlled by it. You have a new life in Christ. That's what baptism is about mainly is standing up to testify, saying this is who I am. It's one of the reasons we wanted kids in the service today. So from a young age, they could be thinking about that. When, when might you, kids, when, when might you want to stand up here and say, I love Jesus. I belong to him. I want to follow him. Have you made your vows? Remember, you're not married until you're married. But once you make your vow to Jesus, once you call on him and wave your hand in desperation and say, save me, Lord, save me, you're united with him. He takes all of your debt. He gives you all of his righteousness, all of his blessing, every good and perfect gift, everything he has becomes yours. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for sending your son to seek and to save lost people like us. We, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. But because you are rich in mercy, you sent your son to bear the penalty for our sin. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we praise you that you, you died on the cross. You died the death we should have died. So you could give us your life and that we might live for you. Thank you that you've given us every spiritual blessing. Your life, your love, your everything. May we no longer live as who we were, defined and controlled by sin. May we now live only for you, for your purposes, for your glory, for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to come to the Lord's table. And again, this is the table of the Lord, not the table.